Many years ago, Peter Rapp started to grow flowers in his garden in Trinidad. To his great delight, his blooms didn't only attract curious flower growers. Enticed by the blossom's generous supply of nectar, wild hummingbirds soon became regular visitors, adding their shimmering beauty to a garden already brimming with colour and splendour. It is these flying jewels that made one tropical horticulturist the equal of Aladdin. are a mixture of varieties, originating from all around the tropics. Spectacular lilies, like this parrotbill heliconia, grow best in Trinidad. Hybrid hibiscus flowers are Raps's speciality, along with garden varieties of tropical lilies. This is a flame lily, or Gloriosa, from Zimbabwe. This bromeliad is originally from Trinidad. It's a relative of the pineapple and is used locally for home decoration. Many of the flowers that Peter Rapps grows are hybrids, carefully bred by him and other growers for their variety of colours and forms. But the basic breeding occurred in the course of evolution over millions of years so the selection can't be specifically credited to growers anxious to see the result of their efforts. A tufted coquette, one of the smallest hummingbirds in the world, feeds at a clump of coleus. It's less than eight centimeters long and weighs just three grams. To maintain its supply of energy, it must feed almost continuously. The flowers supply all the sugar it needs. Hummingbirds suck the nectar from flowers on the wing precision flying at its very best. A ruby topaz demonstrates not only its skill in the air, but also the flashing red and gold colors that give it its name. The ruby topaz is feeding at a branch of Norantia. The red flowers hanging from the branch are in fact just nectaries, living jugs of sugar solution which the birds can drink. The reproductive parts of the flowers are on top of the branch and the hummingbird doesn't touch them. By feeding in this way, the tiny birds are cheating the flower, taking its nectar without pollinating it, thanks to their ability to hover and feed on the wing. Raps's flower garden lies in the Aripo Valley, in the foothills of Trinidad's northern range. The house was built by one of the old planters in the days when citrus fruits cocoa and coffee were the main crops. Now flowers have replaced them. In a place where everything grows very rapidly for most of the year, horticulture is a matter of handicapping the weeds to give the flowers a head start. The gardens are constantly disturbed by this weeding and flower picking, but the hummingbirds seem to accept the disturbance, sitting calmly on a nest while nearby people work in the garden. Work on the flowers speeds up in May, when the crop of anthurium lilies comes into full bloom. They are selected and picked as they come to their peak, and carried tenderly up to the house for packing. This is a crucial time of year for the grower, when unusually dry weather could easily spoil his flowers.
It's crucial too for the hummingbirds. The lilies they watch passing in procession below them are useless as food. The evolution of the lilies was in the direction of attracting insects by colour and scent, so they produce no nectar. But the Norantia is in flower now, ready to yield its energy stores in exchange for pollination. The customers its nectar jugs are supposed to attract are perching birds like white-lined tanagers, known locally as parson birds. They stand on the reproductive parts of the flowers to drain and discard the jugs, at the same time transferring pollen from one flower to another with their feet. The red-legged honey creeper feeds in the same way, but by staying aloft, the hummingbirds bypass the plant's delicately evolved mechanism to take the nectar without pollinating the flowers. In essence, the honey creeper is not keeping its part of the bargain, the offer of food in exchange for the Norantia's chance at reproduction. Other flowers have evolved specifically to be pollinated by hummingbirds, but for now, for the black-throated mango and for the ruby topaz, Norantia provides a wealth of food just when they need to build themselves up for the breeding season. White-necked Jacobin, one of the real experts at hovering flight, is spoiled for choice. Every branch is full of jugs of nectar in rows ready to drink. As the breeze moves the branch, the hummer moves with it in perfect harmony. Beside the little river that runs through Peter Raps's garden, there's an example of one of the flowers which has evolved to serve and be served by long-billed birds only. It's an introduced plant called the Hawaiian torch. This flower evolved specifically to be pollinated by Hawaii's endemic honey creepers. The rings of flowers open in order, day by day from the bottom up, renewing the supply of nectar to attract the birds. The nectar can be sipped only by a bird pushing its bill through an opening at the base of the floral cup. On either side are the flower's stamens bearing pollen. When the bird's bill, or a piece of grass, comes out, it's covered in pollen grains ready for transfer to the stigma of the next flower it feeds on. It works excellently for both parties. The hummingbirds get their food and the flower gets pollinated so that it can produce seeds for the next season. Several different hummingbirds feed at the Hawaiian torch, but the rufous-breasted hermit really makes a meal of it, driving its bill deep within each flower in turn. It's the most successful pollinator as a result, the principal reason for the survival of the Hawaiian torch in Trinidad.
the yellow tube flower has an even more ingenious mechanism. Its stamens and stigma are on long stems sticking out above the nectary. When a hummingbird feeds, the stamens are bent down to tap it on the head, leaving a dot of pollen which is picked up by the next flower, which also leaves a little pollen for the next in line, and so on. The white-chested emerald is too small to take more than the very top of the nectar supply. It can't reach the bottom. To get more, it goes round to the back of the flower and sucks the nectar through a hole which it makes in the bottom of the nectary. The energy requirement of these tiny birds is so high that it's only during a prolonged period of abundant food that they can afford the huge extra expenditure required for the breeding season. The Aripo River runs through Peter Raps's garden, carrying fresh water from the northern mountains of Trinidad. Along its banks can be found the nests of some of the hummingbirds that feed among the garden flowers. Under a riverside leaf is the minute nest of a copper-rumped emerald with two pea-sized eggs. A lichen-covered branch is the nest site chosen by a black-throated mango. To conceal the nest from the other birds, the bird camouflages it with flakes of lichen to match the growth on the branch. The breeding season lasts from January to June and in a good year, the same nest might produce three families. The female raises the young alone, without help from the male. She's under considerable pressure throughout the month that it takes from egg-laying to the fledging of the young birds. It's a big gamble. The bird herself weighs only 10 grams, and her two eggs together weigh nearly the same. This clearly represents a critical investment of her stored resources. When the young birds hatch, the parent's life becomes even more dedicated to food, with insects as well as nectar to find for her nestlings. Along the same stretch of river, another copper-rumped emerald is finishing its nest, smoothing the spider's web binding that holds it to the slender bamboo shoot it's built on. The binding is very important. The bamboo waves in the breeze, and the nest has to remain firmly attached. The finishing touch is a lining of seed down and fine fibres, carefully packed in and trampled into place to cushion the forthcoming eggs. The emerald's dark green colouring provides a good camouflage when it's on the nest in the shade, but when the sunlight catches it, its metallic sheen glints and shines, showing how the bird got its name. Building the nest takes only three or four days, and then the eggs can be laid. The copper-rumped emerald's nest is a marvel of delicacy, but compared to some hummingbird nests, it's a crude affair.
Here is the nest of a little hermit hanging from the underside of a wild lily leaf. This nest is quite differently designed. The tiny cup is suspended on a rope of fibers dangling from the underside of the leaf. Further downstream, there's a hairy hermit actually building its nest. To make the rope, the bird circles under the leaf like a dancer around a maypole, binding the strands together with an outer wrapping of a sticky spider's web. Not far away, there's another little hermit, and this one already has chicks to feed. Because its nest is so small, it has to feed its young on the wing, a delicate operation demanding absolutely steady hovering in a very confined space. The growing young need plenty of protein and lipids, or fat, to keep them healthy through the night. These are supplied by the adult catching small insects for them. Both species of hermit hummingbirds, the hairy and the little, build their nests in the same way, but their choice of site varies from the hidden to the highly conspicuous. Up in a palm tree, the nest is much more exposed to the wind. This underlines the value of a rather cunning feature of the design. As well as binding the upper parts to the frond, the hermit leaves a streamer of grass hanging below the nest. This isn't slovenly construction, but a deliberate and ingenious design technique. The precarious angle of the nest cup itself makes it imperative that the whole structure shouldn't swing too much in a breeze. The streamers of apparently ill-secured building material act as a pendulum steadying the nest when the wind moves the palm frond. As the young birds grow, they have barely standing room on the nest, and they need all the additional stability provided by its design to avoid being thrown out. The hairy hermit feeds its young, half hovering, half steadying itself on the edge of the nest. It's a giant among hummingbirds, 13 centimeters long and nearly 85 grams in weight. At this stage, both parents have to collect one and a half times their own body weight in food every day. Although the young birds receive a mixed diet of fat and protein from insects, as well as nectar, when they leave the nest, they live almost entirely on glucose from that all-important nectar. The advantage of this is that glucose goes almost immediately into the bloodstream. Its disadvantage is that it burns up very fast. This is why hummingbirds feed on insects at dusk. The fat isn't burned up as quickly and helps the bird maintain energy levels through the night. They also are able to slow their heart rate down from the usual 10 beats per second. Even while still in the nest, the chicks exercise their wings, a prelude to a lifetime of total mastery of the art of hovering. The bird's body is almost vertical, 
so that the wings are beating backwards and forwards instead of up and down, up to 80 times a second. They create a steady downdraft to support the bird's weight. Small movements of its tail then enable it to scull backwards and forwards. Hummers are the only birds that produce lift from both the upstroke and downstroke of their wings. Because of the extremely flexible joint at a hummingbird's shoulder, it can actually rotate its wing far enough to enable it to fly backwards under power, one of the few birds that can do so. Peter Raps' flower garden makes an ideal sanctuary for hummingbirds. They don't interfere with his horticulture. In fact, they help him by pollinating the flowers. It seems almost unfair that a man who lives surrounded by such floral beauty should have the added bonus of a wealth of jeweled birds as well. Perhaps, though, there is some justice in the world. A man whose life's work is to brighten the lives of other people by growing flowers should benefit from the flower's constant companions, the hummingbirds. The jewels of Aladdin's garden. <laughs>